next, we have Kevin Gutzman. Professor Gutzman is the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution, Who Killed the Constitution, and James Madison. Stick around. Always launching ideas in your direction. Information is free. The law of the Johnny Rocket Launch Pad. And now, here's Johnny. Hey, it's Johnny Rocket here at the Johnny Rocket Launch Pad, launching ideas in your direction, the Northwest only rock and roll libertarian radio show. I'm here with my co host, Mr. Kurt Nelson. Yes, sir. My voice of reason, the beautiful Heather Nixon. Hi. And this is episode 56. Wow. Yeah. Right? We got, it's pretty cool. We're moving up in the world now. I mean, how yeah. long? I remember episode yeah. two. When, when we had. <laughs> <laughs> one radio station that believed in us. No, we didn't even have that. But we didn't even have one radio station then. My episode two? That was no. We didn't have NWCZ together? No. Ooh. That okay. was like episode 15. Maybe around 10 they picked us up. And then we slowly started building from there. You you were just lying to me the whole time. Don't worry, Kurt. It's airing all over the place, man. <laughs> it's all over the world. <laughs> you don't even know it. You don't even know it. Uh, anyway, so check us out at... NWCZ Radio, Friday, 4 to 6 p.m., Saturday, 8 to 10 p.m., Liberty Talk.fm, Saturday, Sunday, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., Revere Radio Network, Saturday, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., Radio KSCR, Tuesdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., Liberty Move It Radio, Friday and Mondays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., InfoSub, Friday, Saturday, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., CMG Global Radio, Thursday, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., Liberty Radio Network, Random Times, JRLP.Pobdini.com, Facebook forward slash JR Launch, Johnny Rocket Launchpad.com, and I still have Breath to Talk. Wow. Two breaths. Two breaths. I think that's the best I've ever That was done. the best ever. Best that ever. That was the best ever. The best ever. Well done, sir. Well done. And, uh, yeah. Bam! All right, just got to do that. <laughs> Explosion right there. We have Kurt and Heather. We've had, you've had a busy week, Kurt. What's going on oh, with you, man? Oh, man, it's just been crazy. Been crazy. What's going on? Uh, just everything. We're getting a lot of progress done here at SOS and, uh, and, and just building rooms left and right and bringing in contractors and, <laughs> like... Yeah, the building's looking beautiful. You got a new fence out in front. Right, it looks right. awesome. Yeah, we're it getting looks, there. It looks we're fantastic. There. Yeah, and and then of course all the regular gigs and, yeah, and that's cool. And weddings like, and bar mitzvahs and stuff. And the sound, it just sounds fantastic in here, man. You yeah. got the insulation, right? Dude, right. It looks bad. Someday we're gonna actually have sheetrock on the walls. I too. think that's gonna look good. That's gonna be neat. Look good. <laughs> Anyways, though, we have our very special guest, and this, this is, is a good one too. This, this is a good yes, one. Yes, it's a it's a great one actually. We've we, we had to reschedule this this guest a few times now. No fault of anyone's. It's just the way things sometimes happen. But long-awaited guest, New York Times best-selling author, give it up, Professor Kevin R. C. Gutzman. <laughs> Professor Gutzman, how are you? I am very well. How are you? Awesome, awesome. We're honored to have you on our show here at the Johnny Rocket Launchpad. Absolutely. And you are a professor of history at Western Connecticut State University. You hold a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in public affairs, a law degree from the University of Texas at Austin. You also hold a master's degree and a Ph.D. in American history from the University of Virginia. And you've written four books, Virginia's American Revolution, From Dominion to Republic. You co-authored Who Killed the Constitution with Tom Woods. Uh, you also wrote James Madison and the Making of America. And, of course, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution. Wow, what a resume. Man, no kidding. That's awesome. And you've been busy doing that. Well, yeah, I'm actually currently working on the fifth one, which is called Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary. It's a study of Jefferson's radical ideas. Okay. Is it pro-Jefferson or is it kind of a little bit of both? Well, I uh, actually take some pride in the fact that people who had read my Madison biography, several people told me that they couldn't tell whether I liked him. And <laughs> I think that's uh, an uncommon attribute of a study of a historical figure and one that I hope the Jefferson book will also possess. I, I think he's admirable in some senses, and there are other ideas of his I don't agree with. So mm -hmm. what the book is going to do is to describe some of his most important uh, revolutionary concepts and the way that he tried to implement them. 
Right on. Do you have any teasers for us? Something that's just crazy people wouldn't believe? Well, yes. He, <laughs> uh, of course, famously said that all men were created equal. And people have said, well, he was a hypocrite because he owned slaves despite saying that. But actually, he thought that blacks were equally entitled to self-government. And since whites were racists, the only way that blacks could ever enjoy that right was to be sent somewhere else. So he pushed an idea that was called colonization of deporting all the black people from America. Mm -hmm. And one result of this was the founding of the West African country of Liberia, which was established in the presidency of Jefferson's friend, James Monroe, and the capital of which is still called Monrovia after Monroe. Wow. wow. Interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. That's crazy. I, I th yeah. And there are actually several other of his ideas that are pretty odd compared to what we think of as normal nowadays. So I think people are going to find the book really interesting. I know I've been really fascinated in writing it myself. Oh, I'm, I can't nice. wait to read it. No doubt. I think that sounds like an I, because Jefferson is awesome. His philosophy, you know, he took a lot of John Locke's ideas, John Locke's intent and changed it around a little bit. But I mean, a lot of what Jefferson said was awesome. I thought he made a lot of sense, except for the Louisiana Purchase, which I believe was outside of his constitutional authority. However, we can get into that later. What got you interested in history, Professor? Oh, boy. Well, um, my father was an Army officer when I was a kid, and he was always interested in military history. And I suppose that I became interested in military history when I was in my late teens. And that was probably the entree. Right. Nice. I actually, though, first took up the general subject of American revolutionary and constitutional history in the summer of 1987, when I was a graduate student at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas in Austin, and we were required to do a summer internship in a public policy organization. And so I worked in the summer of 1987 on Capitol Hill for a congressman, mm -hmm. and it just happened that 1987 was the bicentennial of the U.S. Constitution being written, so there were all kinds of events and books and other commemorations of that bicentennial, and that's really when I got interested in that subject, which is still the one I work on all the time. Wow. You have a lot of great accomplishments, but did you ever think that you would be like a leading scholar in American history today? Well, I hope I would, of course, but one never knows. So uh, I guess it's been kind of surprisingly uh, successful, my career so far. <laughs> right on. You know, we as a country didn't declare our independence first. Virginia did. Can you explain that? Because I don't think most people know that. Right. Well, what happened was that on May 15th, 1776, Virginia's ruling Revolutionary Convention, which was the old colonial legislature ruling without the governor because he had fled the colony, adopted three resolutions. One called for a declaration of rights. The second one said mm -hmm. that there needed to be a written constitution. And the third called for federal relations with other colonies and treaty relations with other countries. And so that night they took down the, the Union Jack from above the old capital and ran up the Continental Union flag and people in Williamsburg, which was the capital of Virginia right. at the time, celebrated independence on May 15, 1776. They actually implemented their constitution by inaugurating Patrick Henry as the first Republican governor of Virginia on June 29, 1776. That's crazy. I don't yeah. think most people know that, though. I mean, most people just go, oh, you know, July 4th, 1776. That was only just a few months before we actually declared our independence when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, actually, the Declaration of Independence didn't do anything. It, you know, <laughs> people commonly think of it as having made some kind of establishment, but the uh, are establishing some kind of principle. But Pauline Mayer, who's the leading scholar of the Declaration of Independence, wrote in her wonderful book, American Scripture, that the Declaration was just something that made public what had already happened. So actually, the Virginia congressman had been told to declare independence, and the reason was that their state already was independent, and right. so they wanted the other states to join them. And that's really what happened. Interesting. I didn't uh, know that either. Really interesting. And these are the things that, you know, this is the stuff you bring up, that stuff that, you know, public schools just don't teach history correctly. They they have a kind of a, an agenda, more or less. Speaking of an agenda, you wrote the Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution. In response, 
to the heritage guide to the Constitution, <laughs> which I bought. And we were on Facebook, and I was talking to you, and I said, uh, Professor Gutzman, I bought this heritage guide to the Constitution. Is this all right? And he's like, well, this is the reason why I wrote the politically incorrect <laughs> guide to the Constitution. So no, it's not right. No. <laughs> so maybe you could talk about that. How is it different in your perspective? Well, in general, the Heritage Foundation's Constitutional Studies Center is Straussian, which means it's under the domination of a, a small group within the political science community called Straussians, and specifically what are called West Coast Straussians. Mm -hmm. And these are people who are generally Hamiltonian. They think that the U.S. Constitution, well, some of them think that it was divinely inspired as if it were part of the Bible. But in general, these people are kind of worshipers at the, at the altar of Abraham Lincoln and Alexander Hamilton and other people in American history who have argued for unlimited authority in the central government and unlimited authority in the executive branch. Mm -hmm. My work on my dissertation, which became Virginia's American Revolution, showed me that that was not the way that people understood the Constitution when they agreed to it. It was not the way that early Americans thought of their system. That's why they, in 1800, they elected Jefferson president. They elected the Republican, the Jeffersonian Republican Party to control the Congress. They were going to elect Jeffersonians president six straight times. And by the time the third of those guys James Monroe left office, the Federalist Party had ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that it's really propaganda to argue that other argument, and that's why I wanted to contradict it. Right on. I've read the very first part of it. I didn't get through the entire book, but I thought it was great. And it talks about federalism and versus nationalism. And this is a great point because I don't think most Americans understand what the difference is. Let's start with this question. What is federalism? Well, uh, it depends whether you're using an uppercase F. If you're using an uppercase F, then it's referring to the program of the Federalist Party, which was one of the two original political parties in, in the federal system. But the lowercase F is a philosophical principle of federalism. And what that refers to is the allocation of powers between the component parts of the union and the central government that they created. So essentially, a national system is one in which the center came first, or you could say the whole the whole came first, and then they created component parts for the convenience of the center. So for example, in France, at the time of the revolution, um, in beginning in 1789, the French revolutionaries eliminated the historic provincial governments of France. They said that the central government was the nation, and then they created local administrative subdivisions for the purpose of implementing the policies of the central government. Mm -hmm. That's a national system. Right. On the other hand, in America, as in Australia or Germany or Canada or various other places, Switzerland, the Netherlands, the parts came first and they created the central government for their convenience. So typically in a federal system, you have the component parts in America, they're called states still in existence, and they have given only some few specified powers to the central government. That's the way a federal system works. So America's got a federal constitution, and that's the way that people were sold the constitution in 1787, 88, 89, 90, when they were agreeing to live under it. And uh, unfortunately, the people who are in the federal government tend to act as if it were a national government. As I said before, people like the Straussians justify unlimited claims of authority from the central government. And mm -hmm. this to me is radically unconstitutional. It's anti, um, well, ultimately it's anti-American because it assumes that the government has unlimited power despite the fact that we didn't agree to give it unlimited power. Absolutely. So basically, you know, with regarding to a national system, which we've adopted today, where it's a top-down authority, federalism was a loose affiliation on top where they these are the things that the, the government couldn't do where the bottom still retain majority of the power. And I don't think most people understand that when you when we think of states, we have looked at states as just part of the United States as part of the country or a small area of the country versus the intent of each state was a country more or less. Right. Actually, the word state was introduced into modern political science in the 16th century by the Florentine philosopher statesman Niccolò Machiavelli. And Machiavelli meant, by the word state, a sovereign entity that mm -hmm. is one that uh, had ultimate authority in itself. 
So nowadays we've become used to the idea that our states are like a province in Spain or Canada or some other part of the world, right. um, and they exist for the convenience of the central government. But this, again, this is a complete inversion of the system that the people actually agreed to when they agreed to the Constitution. It's the opposite of the principle that um, that Jefferson insisted on when he said in his famous um, bank bill memorandum in 1791, I understand the underlying principle of the Constitution be to be whatever powers are not delegated to the government by this Constitution or denied by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Well, that's the Tenth Amendment. So right. the Tenth Amendment says essentially if the Constitution doesn't say that the federal government has a power, then it doesn't. Right. That power remains in the states. So uh, again, that Tenth Amendment stands for the federalism principle, but we've become used to the idea that, well, the federal government can do anything it wants unless the Constitution says it can't. Right. So <laughs> right. essentially that means it can do anything. Right on. So is this something that happened slowly over time, or was there like a defining moment that uh, the federal government sort of seized power? Well, I wrote a book about that. It's called The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution. And what I show is that there has been a tendency in the federal government to grab at power almost from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, in 1793, a uh, Supreme Court decision was handed down in which the Supreme Court claimed jurisdiction, that is, claimed the right to decide a kind of case that the Constitution had not included in the list of cases that federal courts would be empowered to decide. In other words, the, the Supreme Court was grabbing at more power than it was supposed to have already by 1793. Now, what happened in that situation was that as soon as that decision came down, Congress passed an amendment saying, no, you can't decide this kind of case. Within a very short time, the states ratified it. So the 11th Amendment basically says, no, that decision was wrong and federal courts can't decide this kind of case. But again, what's happened over time is that the people in Washington keep grabbing at more power and the people in the Congress and in the states have, have not been so careful about that problem as they were in the 1790s. Right on. Well, and the thing is, it's like I'm noticing like the judicial system, you, you kind of brought that up. It was like kind of the first to go in, re in regards to corruption. What is the function of the judicial system? I mean, it was the intent to decide or define I don't think that's really a clear distinction. If if you have a case before the court and the two contending uh, counsels say that the statute has uh, directly opposite meanings, then the court has to decide what the law means, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's something a court has to has to do in every case before it. First, it's going to decide before it can decide the uh, the case. It has to decide what the applicable law means. I don't think. That's really so problematic. The, the problematic aspect comes in when the court says, as most of the members of the Supreme Court say now, well, it doesn't really matter what the Constitution is supposed to mean. We're just going to do good. We're, All right. <laughs> we're going to do we, we promise we're going to do really right. goodly here. Well, yeah, they, of course, they always <laughs> claim they're doing good, but they're never going to say we're going to implement our policy, even though it's bad. But essentially, the Supreme Court has come to be a kind of chief lawmaking branch of the American government. We know that we can have elections and we can make determinations. And ultimately, if the Supreme Court doesn't like them, it's just going to say they're unconstitutional, even if they're not. Mm -hmm. And that's the chief subject of politically incorrect guide to the Constitution is that the, the court is now in the business of just doing this all the time. For example, I'll give you an example. About 20 years ago, the, the court decided that um, that homosexual sodomy was not a constitutionally protected right. That mm -hmm. is, if you wanted to argue that you shouldn't be punished for engaging in that activity, you should do so uh, in your state legislative elections or in your state court, but there wasn't a federal right to engage in that kind of activity. Now, mm -hmm. what happened was that as soon as this decision was handed down, that people in elite law schools started saying, you know, I know some gay guys, and I think they should be allowed to do this if they want to. And so we're just going to say it's a constitutional right. Uh -huh. And I predicted at the time, well, since the academic consensus among the elite law professors seems to be that this should be a kind of activity that they're going to call constitutionally protected, <laughs> eventually there will be a, a decision from the Supreme Court saying you have a right to do this. So later there was actually a Supreme Court decision saying you had a right to do that. And then at the time, one of the dissenting justices said, well, you know, the argument you're making here, if you apply it consistently, 
is also going to mean that you have a right to have homosexual marriage. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, it was perfectly predictable that ultimately the Supreme Court would say, I'm sure that they're soon going to say, that there's a federal right to homosexual marriage. Notice I'm, I'm not talking about the question whether there should be laws against homosexual marriage or whether it should be recognized. The issue is that the Supreme Court, because it can decide these kinds of questions, just does so. Right. That is, people on the court decide we have an opinion and we're going to make you accept it. Mm-hmm. Why are we going to make you accept it? Because we feel like it. And there's really no check in the, in the American political system on Supreme Court justices deciding they're going to lie about what the Constitution means because they want to enforce their policy preferences on us. So we've become used to the idea that whenever there's an important social issue dividing the country, ultimately it won't be decided by having a local legislative election or a congressional election or you know having the president and the Congress be from your party and pass a law or something like that. Mm-hmm. Instead, ultimately it'll be decided by the federal court courts saying that whatever the whatever the majority of people on the Supreme Court likes is required by the Constitution. Right. That is not the system of government we're supposed to have, but it's what we have basically in regard to every important social issue. So, um, as I said, I I anticipate that soon they're going to declare that there's a, a federal right to homosexual marriage, which is clearly just facetious. There's no there's no historical argument for that. There's no textual argument for that, but they are going to do that because they feel like it and they can. What about an amendment, though, to actually check judicial decisions? Uh, You know, we could come up with like a 28th Amendment that would actually check judicial decisions. And if a certain amount of states said, hey, this is wrong, we could overturn that decision. Well, of course, the problem is (laughs) it's much easier to prevent a law from passing than it is to undo it once it's passed. Mm -hmm. And so this is why, since really the federal courts got into this business of acting this way in the 1930s, and they just, essentially what happened was we have the Depression, Franklin Roosevelt's elected president, he actually ran for president on a traditional Democratic Party platform of lower taxes and lower spending, but as soon as he became president, he announced the New Deal, which was essentially having the federal government get involved in all kinds of different areas in the economy, decide how much will be produced, how much it'll cost, who, how, what working conditions will be, you know, regulate every kind of uh, quality aspect of the economy and so on. And, mm-hmm. and the Supreme Court said in five cases that these laws were unconstitutional. Well, what what did Franklin Roosevelt and his party in Congress decide to do about that? Well, well, amend the Constitution and give him power to make these kinds of rules? No. <laughs> they, just appoint, right. just, we'll just appoint people to the Supreme Court who will say that these things are constitutional, right. even though they weren't. Right. And then nobody can make an argument that these these bills that were struck down in what's called the first new deal actually were constitutional. In fact, the way that law professors who appreciate what happened here, the way that people who think it was a good thing that he appointed these guys to say that what had been unconstitutional was now constitutional, uh, the way they explain that is by saying, well, we just had a kind of constitutional revolution. Right. So yes, we had a revolution that basically we had Franklin Roosevelt appoint people to the Supreme Court who were just going to lie about what the Constitution said. Just to and get so, his way. Yeah, and so now we've become accustomed again. We've become accustomed to the idea that if a majority of, you know, and actually the coverage in the media of these things is, it reflects this too. If you've been watching, uh, for example, um, NewsHour on PBS, or if you've been watching one of the major news networks or reading newspapers, commonly the coverage of the gay marriage issue is, what do people think? Right? We poll Americans. What do they think? ought to be the policy. But that's not a legal question. You know, we don't decide what the Constitution means by taking a poll. If mm-hmm. it, if, if most people would like for the Constitution to require that everybody be given a billion dollars, then the Constitution requires we each be given a billion dollars. Now, that's really the, adi- that's really the approach they take. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> clearly, this is the opposite of constitutional right, right. government. Constitutional right. government is supposed to be uh, a system in which you have government, yes, but it has limited authority. And Instead, what we have here again is we have people on the Supreme Court are going to tell the states all of them must recognize homosexual marriage, even though the Constitution does not anywhere say they have to do that. I and know. it does say that if a power isn't delegated to the central government, it remains in the states. So if if the Constitution doesn't say it'll be up to the federal government to decide what marriage is, then that power remains in the states. There's just no doubt that that's what the Constitution says. There's also, I think there's also no doubt what the 
court is going to do, which is impose this policy on us. And why? Because they feel like it. Now, notice, I'm not I'm not taking a position on the policy. My state had decided to have gay marriage, and that was perfectly constitutional. And Louisiana had decided not to have gay marriage, and that was perfectly constitutional. Mm-hmm. But what we're, again, what we're going to end up with issue, is- It's a state issue, right. Yes, yes. So uh, we can have, you know, basically my favorite law professor when I was in law school, I, I was an attorney before I went back and got a PhD in history. When I was in law school, my favorite professor at the University of Texas Law School was a guy named Lino Gralia. He's one of the real characters characters in American academia. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he here's how he describes the system. You know, in, in Egypt, they have the army, and in Iran, they have the mullahs. In America, we have the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. So you can have your little election in Egypt. You can have your little election in Iran. You can have your little election in the United States. But in the end, the army, the mullahs, or the Supreme Court are going to decide what your laws are going to be, right? right? So it doesn't really matter what you vote for. Right. You're going to get what the mullahs, the army, or the Supreme Court decide they want. So, Professor, getting back to to the root, what is the role that is assigned to the judicial branch by the Constitution? Well, um, Article 3 of the Constitution says they'll decide cases and controversies arising under the Constitution or laws made and treaties entered into pursuant to the Constitution. So basically, they're supposed to decide legal disputes. Now, notice this is not the way that some other courts work. For example, at the time the U.S. Constitution was written, New York State already had a Constitution from 1770s. And its constitution said that the executive branch of the legislature could go to the judicial branch and say, we're thinking of passing this kind of law. Would you think that would be constitutional? Right. And Mm -hmm. the New York courts would decide that question. Notice that that's not a case or controversy. There was no case. That was just that we want your advice. But uh, but the federal constitution says that the federal courts will only decide cases and controversies. So they'll only decide legal issues. You can't just go to them and say, we're thinking about passing Obamacare. Would you think that would be constitutional. You have to go ahead and pass it and then have somebody bring a suit about it and then have it go into federal courts. And then the federal judges will decide whether they think it's constitutional or if it is how it's supposed to be implemented and so on. Right. That is that's the role that was assigned to the federal courts. Anyway, so this is Johnny Rocket here at the Johnny Rocket Launchpad launching ideas in your direction. A Northwest only rock and roll libertarian radio show. We got Professor Kevin Gutzman, New York Times bestselling. 